Dreams. We're all born with them. Dreams of adventure, of finding a sense of purpose, meaning, of reaching our full potential. And wherever your dreams take you, your journey starts with URAC. Hello and welcome. Before we start today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Welcome to, of course, Let's Chat. And today we are going to be speaking about medicine and I'm joined by Amy, Lindell and Nick, who have got a wealth of knowledge in regards to university entry and medicine. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I'm going to start with Amy. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Trudy, so much for having me on today. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about Western Sydney's um, medicine degree. At Western Sydney University, we have a five-year undergraduate medicine degree called the Doctor of Medicine, and this is taught at our Campbelltown campus. From 2021, um, this has also become a joint program with Charles Sturt University in Orange. Both sites have purpose-built state-of-the-art facilities and the degree is accredited by the Australian Medical Council. It combines on-campus and off-campus study, work integrated learning and an inbuilt research project and a professional portfolio. So that's just a little bit of introductory information about that from me. Thank you. And Lindell, could you, uh, sorry, Amy, could you tell me um, what your role is at Western Sydney? Sure, sorry. So I am in the future student engagement team at Western. So part of my job is to do these sorts of things and go out and visit schools and um, talk to lots of different prospective students, which is a wonderful job. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Lindell, I'm going to pass to you now. So my name is Nidal Parker Newland. I'm Associate Professor of Medical Education at the University of Wollongong School of Medicine, uh, and I'm the Head of MD Admissions. So my role, I get to um, recruit and select students for our program and also talk about our program, as well as teaching in the program, because I'm also a rural GP. And we have a four-year Doctor of Medicine program based in Wollongong and down the South Coast, which we'll talk about some more later. Fantastic. Thanks, Lindal. Um, and over to you, Nick. Thanks, Trudy. Uh, so my name's Nick. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm the Senior Recruitment Product Manager for our Faculties of Medicine and Health and Science at UNSW. Um, effectively, that just means I'm responsible for making sure you've got all the information that you need to make the right decision for you, whether that's UNSW, whether that's somewhere else, like my colleagues joining us today. It's really about engaging with our future students, um, get, getting you excited about uh, you know, your time at university, but equally making sure you've got all the nitty gritty information to make the right decision for you. Um, so I, I do lots of events like this uh, and lots of the marketing promotional work as well behind the scenes. At UNSW, we have a six year program. So it's actually an undergraduate entry degree. Um, and it's the Bachelor of Medical Studies, Doctor of Medicine. Um, we teach it out of our Kensington campus, um, a number of metropolitan hospitals, and then also a number of our rural clinical schools as well. Uh, we've got five of those around New South Wales. Um, similar to some of the other programs that we'll chat about today, we've got an integrated research year um, and lots and lots of those clinical placements that are really pivotal to make sure that you've got the confidence when you graduate to go out there and be the best possible health practitioner that you can be. So we'll talk more about it very soon, but back over to you, Drew. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. And I suppose I should introduce myself. Um, I am the Community Engagement Manager at UAC. And like Amy and Nick, um, I'm always out in the community talking to students about university entry and, you know, really trying to help them through that journey. Um, so, you know, as I said, I work for UAC and UAC, of course, um, is a centralised office that looks after university applications. Um, for not just year 12 students, but also non-school leavers and some postgraduate um, uh, students who are trying to get into um, higher studies after their first degree, which of course is their bachelor. Um, we look after 28 different institutions. Um, we also administer applications for some of our access schemes. So that's schools recommendation scheme, um, educational access scheme and equity scholarships. Now, we're not going to talk about those today, of course. We're going to talk about um, medicine in particular, but, you know, just to make you aware that they are out there. 
Um, the other thing that we're most known for at UAC is the fact that we do calculate um, all New South Wales HSC students ATAR. And uh, of course, that is their rank that um, students receive once they finish high school. And it's one of those things that, especially for medicine, they will need. Um, so you have heard a little bit about um, what kind of medicine uh, degrees are out there, but we do have a number of institutions, and this is where we're lucky in New South Wales, we do have a number of institutions that do offer medicine. Um, unlike other states where they may only have one school of medicine, in New South Wales we have a few, um, and we do have joint programs. So apart from Western Sydney having a joint program with um, Charles Sturt, we also have the University of Newcastle and the University of New England that have a joint medical program, which is the Bachelor of Medicine, uh, Medical Science, Doctor of Medicine. Um, UNSW, of course, and Western and Charles Sturt. Um, but then we do have graduate programs as well. And a few of those as Macquarie has the um, uh, uh, postgraduate medicine course. They also have uh, what we call an undergrad pathway, which is the Bachelor of Clinical Science pathway to the Doctor of Medicine. Um, then we have, of course, the University of Sydney. They have a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science with a Doctor of Medicine. So it's a more of a graduate uh, medical program. And then, of course, we have the University of Wollongong, um, which has the um, Bachelor of Pre-Medical Science um, and which is a pathway to uh, medicine as well as a graduate entry. Um, and we're going to talk more about these in our program today. With admission requirements, and I'll just talk a little bit about that, um, the admission requirements for school leavers, um, or of course non-school leavers, is that uh, a student should have an ATAR um, or equivalent, um, but they will need to sit, of course, what we call the UCAT test, the Undergraduate Clinical Aptitude Test. And of course, students must be invited for interview for assessment. Okay, with postgraduate, it's very similar. Um, they needed, of course, completed bachelor degree. Um, they will need to do the GAMSAT, which is the Graduate Medical Schools Admissions Test. And of course, you will need to be invited for interview as well. But we're going to talk a little bit more about that, um, especially with that grad graduate medicine, because some of these pathway courses may be slightly different if you've completed them. All right, so um, when students apply for university, especially for medicine, um, the applications every year for the following year, so at the moment we'll be looking at 2023 admissions, um, students will need to lodge a UAC application. Now that will happen in April, and especially for those year 12 students listening to us, um, you'll get information from UAC on how to do that. Um, you will also need to lodge an application direct with the School of Medicine at each institution, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, you'll need to, of course, register and sit the UCAT test and, um, of course, wait for that invitation for interview. Um, it's important to note um, that you really should research each course um, that you're considering because things may be slightly different at the university end. So please do your research. And I know for most medicine students, um, they're right on top of their game. They really are researching every detail. And I know that we do have some students come to me, even in year 10, um, making sure that they've got everything right just for this one application. Um, that's admissions. And, and I know that you as, um, as applicants or as future students um, will get more information about this. So really what we want to do today is delve in to some, um, some finer information. And I'm going to ask our panellists um, some questions about, um, you know, all the things that are attached to this application. Um, so I'm going to actually go to you, Nick, to start with, and I'm going to ask you, why do medicine applicants have to place a secondary application um, direct to the School of, of Medicine? 
for their, you know, for their course. You know, they put in their UAC application. Is that not enough? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a really good question and a common question that we get from students. So it is really important to make sure that you're doing that research and double checking what all the requirements are for the, the medical school you're applying for. At UNSW, we call it the medicine application portal, so the map. Um, and really, I mean, for us, it's to get a bit of a more well-rounded understanding of who you are as an applicant. So we don't actually assess you at all based on that map, but it allows us to take into consideration your interests, what's driving you to, to do medicine, um, a little bit of extra information we don't necessarily get to capture based on your UAC preferences, which helps mm -hmm. us in the overall assessments. Um, but as I say, we, we don't really use that to determine if you're going to get into medicine or not, but we actually pass that on to our interview panelists at the end of the year when we do our interviews, and it helps drive some of the conversations and questions. So we can tease out and really understand holistically you know, who you are, what's driving you to, to study medicine. And I think one thing which, which I'd like to land really early, and I'm sure a lot of the other panelists are going to join me in echoing the same kind of sentiment, is that we're really looking for people who are quite mature and have, as you said before, they've done their research, they understand that medicine is, uh, it's a long slog, you're, you're doing a, you know, a four year, five year, six year program, but that's really only the tip of the iceberg because then you go into your internship or residency years, you go on, if you want to go down the specialist pathway, it could be 10 to 15 years before you're actually a, you're an accredited specialist working um, in that, that, that specialty. Again, you'll be working much, much earlier on in many programs in your first few weeks are actually in the hospitals. But it, it is a, it's, a, you know, it's a long commitment and it really is about understanding the, the applicants who are driven by a strong passion um, intrinsically, but also understand you know, and can demonstrate that maturity that it is going to be challenging at times, it's going to be incredibly rewarding, um, but it does require you to, to persevere at times and understand that you know, it, it is, it's, it's a very rewarding career, but it is going to be a challenging one as well. So we're looking for that level of maturity um, and broader understanding. And again, that, that extra application allows us to take that into account and feed that into our, our interview process. Mm. Thanks. Lyndall, would you say the same sort of thing, you know, for that graduate sort of entry, you do the same type, looking at the same thing? Yeah, look, and I think obviously, you know, looking at graduates, uh, there's, you know, obviously we're looking at a, at a different level. But yeah, I think that the, the principles that Nick's described are very similar, that, that motivation, the kind of people that have looked for their information and that are pretty clear with what they want to do. Um, I think that's a little easier in a graduate space that um, people have had a little bit more time, they've done their primary degrees, so they've had a chance to explore their passions and interests academically. Uh, the other thing, and this is particularly for Wollongong, we're also looking at students who have a diverse background of life experiences. So be that employment, volunteering, sport, music, whatever that happens to be, that makes them a diverse and interesting person, allows them to relate to other people. And uh, at Wollongong, we put a focus also on uh, providing opportunities for students from regional, rural and remote communities as well. And that becomes a feature of our selection process. That's good. That's, I mean, it's really good to know this sort of information, you know, and, and hopefully, and I, I expect that students listening to us are doing their research and, and really getting some great information from you. Amy, can I just ask, um, you know, you're uh, with Charles Sturt in that joint program, and I know when students apply, um, they're only putting one course code, like, <laughs> When they're putting that um, that um, secondary application in, yep. what what does does that give us or give students or give the university more information because of the joint program? Can you tell me a bit more about that? Um, well, one thing that I was going to um, to say is when your when our students are going to the interviews and we're looking at their applications and things, we're actually looking for students who are going to be suitable um, doctors in the Western Sydney area specifically. Um, so all of our interview panelists and people that are you know actually conducting the interviews are from the Western Sydney community. Um, there'll be a mix of health professionals, university staff and community members from Western Sydney um, doing that in those interviews. So we're actually looking specifically for people that are going to be um, you know, really well placed in our specific community because Western Sydney, you know, is its own, um, it's very 
a unique community with so many different um, people, for, so many people from diverse backgrounds and all sorts of things. So that's one thing that we are specifically looking at when we're going through um, secondary applications and when we're looking at um, interview performance as well. Um, and so that also, I guess, crosses over with um, Charles Sturt University over in Orange. So, you know, we're looking for students that are going to be well placed in that community as well as Western Sydney. Okay. And so if a student applies for your joint program, mm -hmm. um, I know with like um, Newcastle and New England, um, a student would put on their um, application to the School of Medicine which campus they want. Is that the same with Western Sydney and Charles Sturt? Yes, yeah, so they can choose to be considered for both um, Campbelltown and Orange, and if successful, they'll be allocated a campus, um, but they can also choose a specific campus when they're putting their application in. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, another question I've got is, and if we get this all the time, um, what part of the UCAT um, you know, what, what part does it play in that whole selection criteria? Um, is it a big part? Is it just a small part? Or is it different for each institution? And I might start with you, um, Amy. Sure. So we like to sort of explain to students that the application process for medicine is almost like a, a series of hurdles. So first of all, we're looking at the um, students' Um, ATAR. So for most students, for us, that's 95.5. We're looking at their ATAR. Once they've actually um, achieved that ATAR, then we look at their UCAT results. Um, and then after we've um, established that they have achieved the required UCAT results, then we focus mainly on their interview. So for a student, once they've actually achieved that UCAT result, a lot of their success from then on will actually be determined by their performance in the interview process. Um, we unfortunately don't really get told um, by the School of Medicine exactly what they're looking for each year out of that UCAT um, result because that changes year to year and I guess also depending on the number of students that have applied and, and that sort of thing. So I don't have a huge amount of information to share about what exactly the School of Medicine is looking for out of that UCAT exam, but I do know that after a student has satisfied that criteria, a lot of it comes down to the interview. Okay, fantastic. And would that be the same for you, Nick, at UNSW? Yeah, look, it's, it's similar at UNSW. Um, I guess it's potentially less of a hurdle approach with us, um, it, it, but it's, it's very much the same as Amy. I mean, there's no kind of formula that we can give you that says if you get this UCAT and this ATAR, you'll definitely get the interview. Um, it really depends on the competitiveness of your cohort overall. And so we're looking at three factors to get into medicine at UNSW. It's the UCAT, it's your ATAR. Based on those two factors, that's how we give our interviews. So it means the most competitive applicants overall. Um, and then we, we combine all three of those components together into a magical algorithm, which is designed to make sure that you're as competitive as you possibly can be. So it's never going to disadvantage you, um, but realistically, you need to be performing well in all three of those criteria due to the competitiveness of the program. So you have to have a strong ATAR, you have to have a, a you know, good UCAT ANZ uh, result, and then you've got to perform well in the interview. And I guess on the UCAT front, we're looking for, um, in terms of our, our eligibility range, students who are in that top 50% of, of the UCAT uh, overall. So that, that's the, the, in terms of percentile, we're looking at um, the, the top 50th percentile, but realistically, you're going to have to be performing quite well because um, that's only the minimum that we'll consider. So it's going to depend on the competitiveness of your cohort, um, but we're always going to try to maximize your chance of getting into medicine. So when we put all of those factors together, it's only going to go in a positive direction for you. It's really going to maximize your competitiveness, but uh, you know, as, as we'll get to later on, I'm sure there's many, many different pathways into medicine and the UCAT ANZ is, is just one of those, those kind of hurdles that students go through effectively, but it's not the only way to get into medicine. Um, and I guess the, the other component of this is that um, there's several uh, parts of the, the UCAT ANZ, as many students will be familiar. Um, at UNSW, we only currently look at the first four sections of the UCAT. We don't look at the situational judgment section, uh, but that could change down the track. So that, you know, and this will be the advice I'm sure for most other universities here, um, is really just to make sure that you're doing your research, but then stay on top of that as well. Um, the admissions criteria can change. 
um, you know, really depending on the, the circumstances overall, because again, we're trying to maximize the, the competitiveness of the applicants coming through. So we really encourage you to stay in the loop, keep regularly checking the websites for all the universities that you're applying for for medicine to, to make sure that you're, you're on top of those admission requirements. So it's, it's fair to say that we don't just, we can't just say you're looking at a third of it is your ATAR, a third of the component is UCAT and the third is, is interview because it could be different for each and every student. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And Linda, would that be the same for graduate entry, like for those students who need to do the to do the GAMSAT? So I think that the interesting thing with graduate entry is that it does vary quite significantly from institution to institution. So mm. for some schools, uh, the GAMSAT makes up the lion's share of their selection for interview. It can be uh, the only comp component that they rank on. For Wollongong, uh, we actually have quite a multifactorial process. So we require students to sit GAMSAT. We look at their grade point average from their previous degree. So an important take home message is we uh, do not look at your ATAR. Um, um, so that's really important and you can apply even if you've never had an ATAR as long as you've got into university and completed a bachelor degree and that can be through one of the many uh, school leaver pathway programs that don't require an ATAR that's still fine with us and we also require a portfolio which comes back to those curricular activities that I was talking about. And finally, we ask our students to sit CASPA, which is an online situational judgment test, which gives us an indication of how they cope in problem solving in day-to-day -day situations. As far as GAMSAT's concerned for Wollongong, it, it is a ranking tool, but only a small proportion. We're looking at them as a whole person with all of these other factors included. So it certainly isn't the be all and end all, but it is a very important indicator of how you're likely to succeed in the program. And again, just as Amy and Nick have already said, it all depends on the competition in the cohort of that year. Uh, graduate medicine is also very competitive. Uh, and so there's a hurdle score that we require everybody to get to be considered, but the actual score required to get an interview place may be higher than that. Yeah. And of course, it's my understanding um, over speaking with universities for many years now, that of course, there's not hundreds and hundreds of places in medicine. No, there's not. There's only a few hundred, um, you know, across each institution or within each institution. Yes. Um, and, you know, we always talk to students here at UAC and, and say, you know, we might have, you know, 10,000 students sit UCAT or, or GAMSAT or what have you, but uh, the reality is that you need that backup plan um, because there are so few places and it is so competitive um, for entry. So, um, you I think know, it's one of the things we're lucky in Australia having both undergraduate and graduate entry programs because if your UCAT is not what you hoped it would be or your ATAR is not what you hope it to be, your doorway to medicine is not closed. You just exactly. need to find another pathway. Exactly. And um, so in talking about some of the components of, of entry, um, let's talk about interview. Um, how can a student prepare um, for their interview? And is this an important part? And um, we might go to you, Nick. Sure. Uh, look, I, I guess to come back to what I was saying before, it is definitely an important part because we're looking for that sense of maturity. We're looking for your communication skills as well. How, how well do you uh, communicate, you know, how engaged are you? Are you able to relate to patients? Because I mean, at UNSW, we're going to throw you into the hospitals for the first few weeks. And obviously you're not going to be doing anything uh, too dangerous. That would be uh, you know, concerning for the patients, I'm sure, and for yourself. But you're, you're going to be in there supervised, really getting acclimatized to that clinical setting. So we want to know that you've got the confidence and the communication skills to be able to thrive in that environment. So we're really setting up for success. So in terms of actually preparing yourself for the interviews, we, we definitely err away from the side of pre-preparing anything. Um, a lot of students go down the route of getting coaching or um, you know, going to, um, I guess, other uh, private institutions that, that do help you, you know, coach you or walk you through what uh, institutions are looking for on the interview side of things. We definitely encourage students not to go down that path. And the, the simple reason is we're looking for authenticity. We're looking for what makes you, you, because that's going to make you stand out amongst all the other hundreds of students that we're interviewing for medicine. So um, we, we, you know, we equally have people who have been doing this for, for many years, like yourself, Trudy, um, who know what it's like to, to see a student who's rehearsed, who is saying what they know that we're looking to hear, but it definitely doesn't come across as authentic. So um, you know, you're going to be picked up pretty quickly 
quickly and we'll be able to notice that and it's just not going to go in your favor we want to know what makes you tick what makes you passionate about medicine um, why you want to do this and similar to to what uh, we were talking about before we're looking for that, that well-roundedness as well we want to know what you've been up to outside of the classroom because when you're at university you're not just going to be in the classroom or in the hospitals all the time you're going to be building a lot of other really important skills but outside of the classroom through the club societies through all the volunteering opportunities um, and it, it really is important to have that balance. So we're looking for that well-roundedness. We're looking for that maturity. We're looking for your communication skills. And really, there's nothing you can do to, to kind of prepare, except maybe have a think about yourself and the, the kind of achievements you've had so far, what's driving you, map that out. Um, but we definitely are against uh, you know, going through any formal coaching or that because it's just going to disadvantage you. Yeah, and I think that's a really, a really good point about the communication and if you can speak to other people you know there's nothing worse than than um you know going into a medical practice and the doctor can't look you in the eye um I, I find that a bit daunting I know some other people may not but I find that quite daunting when they can't look at me and and really tell me what's going on um because I'm one of those that really wants to know so I mean, I would expect Lyndall that that would be very similar scenario for graduate medicine as well yeah, absolutely. And and I think Nick has hit the nail on the head um, about wanting to know who you are and what makes you tick. Whether you're in the undergraduate or the graduate um, application cycle, that um, pre-coached, pre-rehearsed, overly polished kind of approach tends to not be successful with the programs. Mm. We want to know you and who you are, not which course you did or which training program you did. And so I strongly agree and we strongly discourage the use of preparation programs. Think about why you applied to medicine in the first place. You've gone through a path to get here. What makes it important to you? Why did you want to come to our school? Why in general? Um, what is it about you that makes you interesting? What do you bring to medicine? And what are your strengths and weaknesses? Um, you know, what is it that makes you an interesting human? That's what we're interested in. Amy, um, you know, I'm, I, I expect you're going to say exactly the same thing, but I'm sort of going to step back a bit and talk about you, Kat, again. Um, you know, we hear students say, oh, there's training programs for you, Kat. Would you recommend those? Um, so we don't um, recommend taking them or endorse any of the providers that that run the UCAT preparation um, courses or anything. Um, there are resources that you can um, get on the Pearson website. So they're the company that facilitates the UCAT. Um, you can access resources from them on their website, um, but we don't, there is a no specific course that we endorse or recommend that you take to prepare for the UCAT. I do know of students who have done courses and did find it helpful. Um, it really will depend on the individual, I imagine. Um, you know, some students will feel that they do want that extra support and that extra preparation. But I really think that, you know, going to the Pearson website, looking at any resources that they have is probably going to be um, your best bet if you do feel that you need that extra support. And Nick, you would say the same, I would expect. Yeah, no, exactly the same. Um, definitely jump on and do those practice exams and practice tests that are on the UCAT ANZ website. Um, but beyond that, I mean, really, it's going to come down to the individual. And, um, you know, we've seen, you know, many, many students who have come through and have performed excellently just because they've, they've gone through, they've done those practice exams um, and they've, they've thrived. So we definitely don't endorse any private coaching or that, but ultimately it's, it's the decision of the individual. Fantastic. Lyndall, I'm going to go to you now, being the academic of, of all of us. Um, could you tell me a little bit about what a student um, is going to study when they get into medicine? You know? uh, sorry, Trudy, I cut you off. Go on. No, it's okay. Keep going. Um, I look, I think... When, when students are studying medicine, there's obviously going to be slight variations from course to course, whether you're studying undergraduate or graduate or which program you go to, but the fundamentals are actually exactly the same. And, you know, whether we whether we do it in four, five or six years, at the end point, you're going to graduate as a junior doctor, ready for specialty training in any field of specialty in Australia. Now, as far as what you study, it's going to be broad 
and I hope interesting and motivating. But what our students will study, uh, certainly at Wollongong and at all the programs will be both the underpinning sciences, and that's often where we start in all of our programs, looking at not only the hard science of how the body works, but also the behavioural science about how people work and how people interact, and looking at uh, the uh, public health science and the population science of what makes up our society. And then moving from that into the sciences of what happens with diseases and their effects on the body, and then how we can recognise them, how we can manage them and treat them, but always keeping that core of the patient is the focus for all of our education. In all medical schools, there'll be a focus on clinical placement. When that happens varies from program to program and where that happens depends on program to program. At Wollongong, because of our focus on rural, regional, remote health, all of our students do a extended period of placement in rural communities. That's not universal for every program. Uh, some will have some students and some will focus in metropolitan areas as well. It all depends on, and that's where the research for your program you want to apply for is very important. I think if there's you know one thing that we all will share in common uh, is for all medical schools, not just the ones represented here, is the aim of making our graduates as excellent clinicians, high level communicators that are practicing evidence-based, patient-centered and uh, equitable care, aiming to decrease disadvantage in health in Australia is probably something that we can all agree on. So Nick touched on earlier that their students go into work with patients fairly early in the piece. Yes. Um, does that mean that, you know, each year you're spending more and more time, I expect, with patients? Is that correct in saying that? or I think for most medical schools, that's exactly the model. So in most medical schools, in the early clinical years, we do clinical placements to help put the sciences and the, con the content in context so that we actually are reminded why we're here and if we're learning about the heart this week or we're learning about uh, um, cancer this week we can talk to people who've had those experiences and understand how they fit together mm. as we go through the course students have more clinical experience more responsibility and more skills and they become more embedded as part of a health team so to start with they're watching by the end they're doing and they're ready to work oh that's fantastic to know and it's you know it, it's always um it, for any university student it's always daunting when you first go in so mm -hmm. it's sort of good to get your head around well where things are going to work and you know how much placement is going to be you know emphasized within the course and things like that and I know it's different from institution to institution and of course from undergraduate to postgraduate but thanks for giving us a snapshot on that I'm going to go back to talk a little bit more about admissions. Um, you know, we've got Nick and Amy here who look after undergraduate courses, but what if a student doesn't get into an undergraduate program? Um, what, I mean, with, with, with Wollongong, of course, you have your um, pre-medicine, which, you know, students could certainly preference on their UAC application um, if they don't get into to the undergraduate programs. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, and I'm going to ask you, Amy, um, what course should a student, you know, take on as their backup plan if they don't get in straight away? Sure. So at Western, we recommend that students simply choose another degree that they are interested in and that they think they'll do well in. We don't actually look at or preference any specific degree over another. What we're looking at is the student's grade point average that they've acquired in their degree, as well as the other criteria, the UCAT and the interview. Um, we would obviously recommend that students um, consider looking at our other allied health and science degrees as other options. So um, nursing, medical science, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, those sorts of allied health degrees. Um, however, you know, if a student is doing business um, and they're getting that grade point average um, that we require them to have, then, you know, they've still got just as good a chance if they've, um, if they've achieved the UCAT requirements as well and they do well in the interview, then, you know, what degree they have been doing is not going to disadvantage them if they're doing something that's completely not health related. Um, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it does make sense. Um, 
Because, you know, that's one of the biggest questions we get. Okay, so what if I don't get medicine, what should I be studying? Yeah. And, you know, I know that we do have Wollongong or, or some of our other institutions with pathway courses. But, Lyndall, if a student did go into the pre-med, you know, what kind of, you, you know, when they get to the end, do they get guaranteed entry because it's a pathway course or how does that work? Yeah. So... One of the things, just to step back for a moment, is to agree completely with what Amy has said. Is so at the University of Wollongong, we have no prerequisites as far as degree entry to medicine. Mm -hmm. So when students at high school who are thinking about graduate entry or who maybe didn't get into undergraduate and say, what should I do? Do what you love and that you're going to do well at. And mm -hmm. that can be anything. So students coming into our program may have a background in medical science, may have their first degree in arts or history or French or music. And that's completely fine. For some students who are very clear that they want to stay in the medical science, then our pre-medicine science and health program, along with medicinal chemistry, medical science, our other science and health programs are also a very good option for them. The pre-medicine program has been designed to provide a scaffolding and entry for medicine. So it certainly contains subjects and programs that will be helpful for students entering the medical program. It is not a guaranteed entry pathway. Although students, and, and I think Nick raised a very good point about the things that selection can change, but as we currently stand, students who achieve very highly uh, in the pre-medicine program uh, can be guaranteed a place at interview for medicine at Wollongong. They're still required to meet the other selection requirements. But it, it's a pathway in that it allows you to be with a small focused cohort of students where medicine is clearly their goal. And a number of students from our pre-medicine program are currently studying medicine at Wollongong and also studying medicine at other graduate and undergraduate programs across Australia. So if you know that that's where you want to go, that's a pathway for you. However, if you also would love to spend four years improving your violin, studying Japanese or looking at ancient history, we're all for that too. Fantastic. So would a student, let's say, that does the pathway, so the pre-med, yes. do they have to do GAMSAT as yes, well? they do. They, do. they still yes. have to, yes. Yes. Okay. Because GAMSAT is not just about knowledge. So GAMSAT is similar to UCAT. It's about aptitude and ability and problem solving. So it's not a pure knowledge. If it was pure knowledge, we could just take it all on ATAR or on GPA and a science degree. But GAMSAT and UCAT measure more than just knowledge. So we still need to see that your aptitude, your ability to problem solve and ability to focus on those other sections as well in communication and uh, interpretation. Fantastic. Um, Nick, can I ask you, Let's say I'm a year 12 student. I applied for medicine. I didn't get into medicine. So I went into, you know, something else. Doesn't, doesn't really matter what it is, but I went into something else. Could I apply again for medicine at the end of my first year of study and try again? Really good question. And, and equally, I think embedded in that is actually really good advice, which is if the university permits it. So many of the institutions that have that undergraduate entry medicine pathway allow you to keep reapplying year after year. Um, if, if that's the case, then go for it. That, that is our best advice is if you're still passionate about medicine, then pursue a degree, as Amy was saying, pursue a degree you're passionate about because you're going to perform well in it. You'll put in the extra hours, you'll put in the extra effort to do well in it. Um, and then, I mean, at, at UNSW, for example, if you've done at least one year of full-time study, then we actually have an algorithm that, again, designed to maximize your competitiveness overall. We'll look at the best of um, either your ATAR results or your weighted average mark in your university study. So if you perform really, really well in that first year, for example, say you, you kill it with high distinctions all around, you're going to put yourself in a really strong position to reapply for medicine. Now, there are minimum requirements, so we still need to have a minimum of a 96 ATAR, um, 91 if you're in the rural entry scheme, um, and a minimum of a 70 weighted average mark. Uh, but then ultimately, we'll look at the best of those two. Um, and then many other universities have a similar approach where you can keep reapplying year after year. Um, very few of them don't. So it is worthwhile double checking to make sure the university does allow you to keep reapplying year after year. But, you know, I mean, in terms of that, that really common question we get about what do I do if I don't get in? 
my advice is always choose something you're passionate about, keep reapplying year after year. You'll need to keep sitting the UK and A and Z, unfortunately. So hopefully you get really good at it very, very quickly um, or very bored of it. I'm not sure which one, um, but keep sitting that year after year, keep reapplying. If you get to the end of your, your undergraduate degree and you still haven't got into medicine, then as we we're saying, there's so many pathways that the brilliant thing is you can then apply for postgraduate medicine because you've got that undergraduate degree under your belt. At UNSW, you can keep reapplying for our, our undergraduate entry program as well, even after you finish your first degree. Um, but if you get into a postgraduate medical, medical program, most of them are only four years, so you've actually got a, a kind of a shorter pathway there. But I mean, as Amy was alluding to as well, there's many of those um, other health programs that are out there that the health sector is absolutely enormous. There's many ways you can make an impact. So if you find that, that that's ultimately what you're about is making an impact to other people's lives, choose a clinical pathway, choose a non-clinical pathway, go down the research pathway. There's many, many programs that are out there to help you. Um, and it, it, it's also just worth reiterating, do, do that research on all the admission pathways that are out there. And it's as simple as picking up the phone and chatting to each institution because we've all got amazing future student advisors who their entire role is to help you work out what that pathway is gonna be for you. And it can help you work out that actually there's all these additional pathways you weren't aware of. I mean, at UNSW, we've got the lateral entry pathway for students who are in medical science. It's a very competitive pathway um, where students, we, we take about 10 students every year. And again, keep in mind, there's about 200 students in medical science, so it's quite competitive. But it's another pathway for students who already wanted to do a medical science program because they love that idea of going down the research pathway, but want to keep medicine open as an option. So it's, it's really just about doing the research so that you can find all those other avenues that are available to you and put your best foot forward ultimately. Fantastic. That's really good, really good advice. Amy, I'm going to ask you a question. Now, this is a question that came to me just recently, which I've never had before in all the years I've been with UAC, but I was asked whether... If a student did nursing, is, is that a really good step up into medicine? And, you know, would they get some kind of advantage? Um, nursing is not um, considered a pathway to medicine um, at Western. However, I would imagine that, you know, if someone has done a nursing degree or part of a nursing degree, that they are already going to have a lot of those um, skills, problem solving skills and things like that, that we will be looking for in the interview process. So um, even though they may have completed a nursing degree, they will still have to apply and do the UCAT exam um, if they're halfway through a degree or something. They'll still have to do all of those steps. Um, we'll be looking at their grade point average uh, throughout that degree that they've achieved. We'll be looking at their UCAT result and then we'll also be looking at their performance in the interview. However, I do imagine, as I say, that um, you know, having completed a degree or being partway through a nursing degree, which is very practical, very hands-on, um, especially um, at Western, I know that they they're in clinical placements um, from their first year. So those students are going to have a lot of those skills that we'll already be looking for in the interview. Interesting. Thanks for that. Um, Linda, I'm going to go to you and ask you, could you tell me the difference between a bonded and non-bonded place? So basically, uh, the Commonwealth supports medical school places across the country, and a proportion of those medical school places uh, are still a Commonwealth supported place, but are required for students to work uh, after they finish their training in a regional rural area. And that's a bonded medical place. And so there's slight variations of the contracts from year to year. And there's been over the you know 15 years I've been in the profession, sorry, in, the, in academia, they've changed quite a bit. But uh, generally, it's a small period of time like a year two years where you're required to work in that area while you're a student nothing changes for you your education is exactly the same and your program is supported exactly the same um, we see it actually as a positive thing it allows students to work in other environments it provides workforce support and stability for rural communities that may not get doctors elsewhere um, and we encourage strongly all students to consider taking a bonded place as it provides more opportunity and flexibility for them to get into medical school nick you'd say the same as well uh, yeah, look, I mean, exactly the same advice, really. I think uh, Lindell summed up those differences really well. But I mean, 
a, a bonded place just means that you're going to have that, that opportunity at the very end of your program. And, and again, it's not, you know, that there's, there's, there's quite a time afterwards where you've got to be able to fulfill that requirement. It ultimately comes down to, you know, that individual contract that you're making um, with the, the Commonwealth government when you're accepting your bonded place. But I mean, a lot of specialty programs and, and a lot of hospitals really value that you've had that regional or remote experience. Um, it's not always regional or remote either. It is just, you know, places of need. So it can Good point. Be, it does yeah, depend yeah. on the specialty. Yes. Exactly. So, I mean, it really is worthwhile just keeping in mind and, and taking a really optimistic perspective towards it, that it's actually going to give you a very unique, uh, you know, and often a lot of the time, very hands-on experience you may not get in some of those metropolitan hospitals in the middle of the city. So you're actually going to have a, a different set of skills, um, a different set of experiences that are hopefully going to open you up to a lot of other opportunities down the track. And, and we definitely see that with where our graduates go on to, to pursue their specialties and where they end up ultimately at the end of the day. And um, are, are all medical programs um, Commonwealth supported places? No, not all. So certainly uh, within graduate and undergraduate, there are the majority of Australian medical schools have Commonwealth supported places, but there are some medical schools that offer uh, a small proportion of fully uh, fee paying places and some medical schools only offer full fee paying places. So just as Nick has said before, it's another avenue to do your research and be clear about what you or your family can afford for you to do financially um, and what would work for you in your financial situation. So there's a combination of options available to many programs. Some of those uh, full fee paying school places uh, are almost entirely covered by the loan programs and some will not be covered by loan programs. So again, do your homework carefully as regard to the financial institutions, but the majority of medical school places across both undergraduate and graduate are Commonwealth supported. That's good information to know because we know that most medical, medical um, um, students or, or those who are wanting to go into medicine, I should say, um, they apply all over the country. Yes. Um, because of the competitive nature and the limited places and so forth. So it is really good to do your research. Um, Amy, can I ask, do, do, are there scholarships for medicine students like there are for any other degree? Um, yes, so uh, we will have scholarships that can be applied for. We will have um, scholarships that will be any student from any degree will be eligible for some of our scholarships. And then there are scholarships that are specifically for medicine students. Um, and it'll, it's just a matter of having a look at our website. We've got a really great um, find a scholarship tool. So you can fill in some information about yourself, um, some demographic type information and what sort of course you're looking at doing. And then it will actually bring up a list of all the different types of scholarships that you could be eligible for. And then it's just a matter of having a look at um, the individual scholarships and their opening dates and their selection criteria. But what we always say is apply, 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 because some scholarships um, may sit and not be awarded because nobody has applied um, for that scholarship that year. So even if you look at the criteria and think that maybe you only meet a couple of the criteria and not all of them, we would still recommend that you apply because you actually never know whether somebody else has applied for it. You may have been the only person that meets, you might be the person that meets most of the criteria and therefore you might be eligible for it that year. And this is something that UAC's always talking about with students is please apply for scholarships. You know, so many students self-select out. They say, I'm not the tallest, smartest, shortest, whatever. And they find a reason to psych themselves into you won't pick them. Um, yes. But as you said, Amy, sometimes they go left untouched because people don't apply please just apply students. It doesn't I take think, you anything except a bit of time and you, you know, you just never know. I think some students also um, get a little bit um, intimidated maybe by the application process, especially for some scholarships that may ask for things like a personal statement. Um, in those sorts of cases, a lot of, I know our website has some great resources that can help you, um, you know, to practice putting those sorts of applications and personal statements together. And I'm sure other universities have similar resources as well. Yeah, fantastic. 
Um, I'm just going to go around to each and every one of you now and just ask you what would be um, your best advice to students considering medicine? And I'm, I might go back to you and um, Amy to start. Um, my advice would be to not give up, to if you don't happen to get in that first um, year, keep applying. I actually recently heard a story about one of our students who had applied straight out of high school, um, got to the interview process and unfortunately didn't quite get through the interview that year. She applied again the next year the same story that second time didn't quite get through the interview process third year she got in and got an offer um, and is now one of our medicine students so I know that it can seem daunting and it can seem um, quite disheartening if you don't quite make it that first time but I would um, encourage everyone to not give up um, obviously this is you know if you've gone through UCAT and you've achieved that ATAR this is obviously something that you really want to do therefore you would be perfect at it because you've got that drive so keep going and keep applying. Thank you. Lyndall? Uh, I agree with everything Amy said and I would add on to that to know that you have options and so we're really lucky in that we have so many really high quality medical schools in Australia there's no bad medical schools here and that's a wonderful thing so you get to choose you don't have to worry about which is the best medical school because they're all great you get to choose which is the best for you think about your strengths look at the selection processes and find where you feel that you are going to be the best fit for your education play to your strengths and if you're a school leaver and you don't have an ATAR of 99 the door is not closed that would be my take-home message you've got options within the undergraduate programs you've got options with the postgraduate programs focus on doing a program an undergraduate degree that you love and keep trying fantastic now I will go over to Nick what would you say Look, a uh, hard act to follow because I think uh, Amy and Lindell's advice really captures the sentiments uh, up really, really nicely. But look, I might uh, change track and, and just say that, look, ultimately opportunities breed opportunities. And I think it's a, a really important thing to keep in mind as you're going through those final years of high school, it, it is about balance. D don't give everything up. I, I know lots of students who ask us and say, should I pair back from all, all the musical commitments and sporting commitments and debating and public speaking and all that kind of stuff so I can focus on my studies, maximize my ATAR, maximize my UCAT score? And the answer is no, it's about balance. You wanna be able to have those activities because they make you a well-rounded individual. They build all these other skills that are really important. And you'll find that when you get to university, it is still about that balance. You're spending a, you know, a lot of time in the hospitals, a lot of time in the classroom, but a lot of time outside of that getting involved in the student life side of things, volunteering, getting involved in the clubs and societies. Our medical student society at, at New South, um, they do an annual review every year where they all get up, they sing, dance, they choreograph it. It's a huge spectacle. And they do that on top of everything else because it's, it's another way to build a lot of those critical skills and to build the friendships that are going to be really pivotal for the rest of your life. You're going to go through medical school and you're going to, to have all of these relationships that are going to help you at every stage of your career, and they're going to be friends and colleagues that will support you, but they'll also be really important contacts sometimes for when you're going for those job interviews or you're trying to get into that program and you, you, you're, you're a known entity. So really put yourself out there. You never know what opportunities are behind that next layer of opportunities. So um, really put yourself out there and, and make sure you're striving for that balance at the end of the day. Thank you for that. And, and I think you'd have to say that today we've heard some fantastic information um, around university entry into medicine. Um, you know, really it's about your passion, it's about doing your research and uh, about following each step and not, you know, you know, if you don't get in, don't, don't fret. Um, there's so many other pathways, um, you know, you could go, uh, a pathway course you could do any course uh, and do then of course graduate medicine um, there's just so much out there um, and so much advice and so much help that I would certainly recommend students to please contact each institution that you're interested in um, when it comes to medicine get their take on it uh, because you know they we are all here to help you um, but of course 
you know, it's about keeping up your studies and well as well and getting those uh, the best marks you possibly can to, of course, make yourself as competitive as you possibly can to get in into medicine. Um, I want to thank you all for being with me today. Um, I, I really do appreciate um, your time. Um, I know that our students will love this, um, this webinar because of the information you're given. And um, thank you once again. UAC represents many institutions across New South Wales and the ACT. The universities featured in today's webinar are a small selection of the many institutions which offer the courses discussed today. Students should research all university offerings so they can make informed decisions regarding their future study.